Hello, my name is Jamie Brown and I'm an actor and a theatre director from Gateshead. Um, my route into acting was a pretty conventional one, I suppose. I studied it at GCSE and A-level and then went on to do a three-year practical acting course at Bretton Hall and graduated in 2006. I'm freelance, which means I'm not attached to any particular organisation, theatre or company, but I do have a long-standing relationship with the Customs House. And the Customs House are responsible for a few big milestones in my own career. They gave me my first professional acting job within the North East when I took on the role of Rudy in The Machine Gunners, um, the revival of the musical. And since then, um, I've played a number of central characters, John Simpson Kirkpatrick in The Man and the Donkey, uh, John O'Brien in Catherine Cookson's The Fifteen Streets, Charlie McFell in Catherine Cookson's The Cinderpath, and amongst many others, most recently Jack Ford in the theatrical premiere of When the Boat Comes In. But today I'm here as um, a Shakespeare specialist, I suppose, to run a class on approaching Shakespearean text. My own relationship with Shakespeare uh, is a long one. I specialised in classical theatre at Bretton Hall and since then I've performed in UK and Ireland tours of A Midsummer Night's Dream and As You Like It. I've performed as Benvolio in Romeo and Juliet in Plays in the Park, which was commissioned by the Customs House. And I'm also an associate artist and the learning director of 1623 Theatre Company, who are based in Derby. And they specialise in Shakespeare and they explore Shakespeare's characters, stories, situations, plays, and they find the resonance that they still have in today's society and they use Shakespeare's work either to do adaptations to highlight mainly social discriminations or injustices or indeed we use that material to create new material based on Shakespeare's characters, stories and situations. What I'm going to do today um, as learning director of 1623 Theatre Company I talk to a lot of students and one of the big things that they're worried about is uh, approaching large blocks of text so monologues or soliloquies and I can completely understand why if we take a book uh, like this which just happens to be one that's full of audition speeches and yeah if you look at something like this piece of text here I look at it now as somebody who's worked in Shakespeare for around 20 years and yeah, I just go, oh, I don't fancy that. But the thing is, there will be a time if you're applying for colleges or universities or drama schools or preparing yourself for an audition early on in your career where you just have to. You have to approach something like that and you have to have the tools to get it up onto its feet, the nuts and bolts of it, just to get the ball rolling. I can understand why that might seem like a daunting prospect because... It's like somebody taking you outside and looking at a starry sky and asking you to paint it and you're standing there thinking, where do I start? And once I've started, which direction do I go in? And one of the analogies that I think really has resonated and I've had success with with a lot of people is looking at these speeches or soliloquies as a map. And this session is going to be about you planning your route to your destination. So from A to B, the start to the end of the monologue or soliloquy. Okay, so we're going to get into the practical element of the class now, and it's going to be split into two sections. The first section, we're going to do a little test drive, if you will, where we're just going to concentrate on one line of Shakespearean text. And then I'm going to do a sort of blind reading of a piece of text that I'm not familiar with. I'm going to just find something from that audition speeches book that I showed you before and I'm going to hopefully put into practice what I'm expecting you to do and we'll work through it together. It'll be a discovery for both of us and hopefully it'll work. So first things first, we've got this first line of Shakespearean text which is from one of Shakespeare's plays and is spoken by one of Shakespeare's characters. Which play and who it is is not important at this time. Point. So, taking this idea of a line of Shakespeare or a Shakespearean speech as a map and you planning your route 
through that map, we're going to do the following. The first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to survey or assess the journey. And in order to do that, we're going to read each individual word and we're going to see at each point along the way if we run into any difficulties or if there are any particular points of interest. Okay, so areas of difficulty might be words that are ambiguous or that you don't understand at all or references that you don't understand. Points of interest might be alliteration or assonance, it might be repetition of words, it might be words that have a particular sound quality that you're drawn to or that just evoke something in your mind. Okay, so give each word its due. All we're going to do really simply is read it through one word at a time, appreciating the sound quality, appreciating all the different components of this little journey that we're about to make. So let's just read it through together. Hopefully that line will be on your screen now. If by your art, my dearest father, you have put these wild waters in this roar, allay them. One more time. If by your art, my dearest father, you have put these wild waters in this roar, allay them. Okay, so what are you drawn to? Are there things that you don't understand? You are the best judge of your thoughts and relationship with this text. What I glean from that, coming at it for the first time in a long time, if by your art, now the word art could be ambiguous in meaning if we don't know much about the character. Is, is the character talking about art as in painting, as in a dark art like magic, as in artfulness, craftiness? That's something that I would need to be aware of and explore more closely. And also um, possibly the word allay. If you weren't familiar with the word allay, um, then you might want to look that up. As I understand it, it's kind of put them to rest, calm it down. So if by your art, my dearest father, you have put these wild waters in this roar, allay them. So there's a little bit of alliteration in wild waters that might give us something of interest to play with there. There's also this mention of dearest father. So you get a, bit, a little bit of an idea of relationship there as well. Another interesting thing is that you start your journey on this line with an if. And it's hardly the most um, secure start to a journey. It's almost a false start. If. Oh, it hardly puts you off on a strong footing. So that's something that immediately stands out to me as well. Now what we're going to do is we're not going to do anything about those at the minute. We're just going to acknowledge that they're there. The second thing that we're going to do is something that I call punctuation mapping. If you have done something like it before, you might refer to it as a different name. But what we're going to do is we're going to physicalise the changes in direction that this route plan takes us in. And in order to do that, we're going to hold a piece of paper up in front of our face with the line on it. And we're going to start walking as we read the text. So if by your art and for every punctuation point that we meet, we're going to change direction. My dearest father, you have put these wild waters in this roar. Allay them. Okay. And the reason that we're going to do that is that Shakespeare more than anyone I think, gives you these signposts as an actor. Again, using that analogy of this being a route plan, these are signposts along the way, those points of punctuation. And sometimes it's very easy for our brains to process them, and they process them so quickly that we don't appreciate them. But then by physicalising them, it forces you to take notice of them a little bit more. Okay? So we're going to read it through together twice, and for every punctuation point we hit, we're going to change direction. Off we go. If by your art, my dearest father, 
You have put these wild waters in this roar. Allay them. One more time. <clears throat> if by your art, my dearest father, you have put these wild waters in this roar, allay them. Okay, what do we notice? Well, what I notice is that she's making one point, but there are several changes in direction. Okay? She basically wants to go up to her dad and say, stop the storm. And that's a nice direct route. Stop the storm. No punctuation. It's the most direct route between me being where I am and getting to my point. Okay? And for the purposes of this, the camera is my point that I'm trying to get to. Now, this character trying to get to their point, okay, I set off trying to achieve my goal, get my point. If by your art, all of a sudden, the punctuation takes me in a different direction. My dearest father, you have put these wild waters in this roar, allay them. Okay, so it takes me four little clauses to get to my point, where I could just walk in and say, stop the storm. Now, as an actor, I'm thinking, that's what I'm trying to do. Why don't I just do it? Why do I skirt around the issue? We know that they have a point. We know that they deviate several times before getting to that point. The next question is why? So let's take that first piece of the line. If by your art, my dearest father, the deviation is so that the character has the opportunity to say, my dearest father. Why do they feel that's important enough to deviate away from their point? Is it because they want to show that they understand the dynamic, the power dynamic, that they have respect for their father? They want to endear themselves to their father, my dearest father. Are they playing to their ego? That's something to think about. If by your art, my dearest father, you have put these wild waters in this roar, allay them. These are the things that we begin to notice. And we could go on about this all day and you will come to your own conclusions and you should explore those conclusions, okay? Because there are no right and wrong answers in this. As long as you can justify your interpretation then you can take ownership of that text and all of the decisions that you make and you can be comfortable with that. So we're going to move on now to part two, which is the extended piece of text. Okay, so for the second part of this class, I'm going to approach an extended piece of text that I haven't seen and hopefully find something that I'm not familiar with so we can put these things into practice on something that we're on an even footing with. Um, so, as I said before, I have this alternative Shakespeare auditions for men book. Um, it's not actually my book. I borrowed this from uh, my wife, who used to be a drama teacher. And I'm opening it at the page here. Um, and we've got a speech from Love, Love's Labour's Lost. Can't even say it. Don Adriano. And apparently this is from Act 1, Scene 2. It's definitely not something that I'm familiar with on the page there. I don't know if you can see that is the chunk of text that we're looking at. It's definitely something that I haven't studied before. Now, that's great because this is a route that I want to discover alongside you. So if you can have a copy of Act 1, Scene 2, uh, we will get it up on the screen as well for you. The few lines that we're going to look at. I'm going to do exactly the same thing as I did before. So I'm approaching the text. It looks like a big old chunk. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assess the terrain. I'm going to look at the individual components. And I'm going to read it through word for word, out loud, in order to appreciate all of the separate components. I'm going to see what difficulties might lie along the way or what points of interest there might be. So let's read it through together if you're reading along with me. Feel free just to listen. 
I do affect the very ground which is base, where her shoe, which is baser, guided by her foot, which is basest, doth tread. I shall be forsworn, which is a great argument of falsehood, if I love. And how can that be true love, which is falsely attempted? Love is a familiar, love is a devil, there is no evil angel but love. Yet was Samson so tempted, and he had an excellent strength. Yet was Solomon so seduced, yet he had a very good wit. Cupid's butt shaft is too hard for Hercules' club, and therefore too much odds for a Spaniard's rapier. And that'll be enough for us to get on with. Okay, so what do I notice there? I do affect the very ground right at the start of this speech. Now, affect there, um, I have some notes here, which is very helpful. It says love there, so I do love the very ground, okay? So affect as in have affection for. I'm also noticing the base, baser, and basest, and yeah, the escalation that we have there, that's something that as an actor I'm drawn to. Um, the repetition and the capitalization of the word love. Love is a familiar, love is a devil, there is no evil angel but love. So there's definitely a theme coming through there. Also, we have these mentions of Samson and Solomon and Cupid and Hercules, all of which, um, if I don't know anything about, I might want to look further into before I set off on my journey. There are clues there though, even if you don't know who Samson is, it tells you he had an excellent strength, so it's somebody strong. Even if we don't know who uh, Solomon is, we know that he had a very good wit. These are all things that I would take into consideration and some of them I would want to look into if I didn't know who Samson or Solomon or Hercules or Cupid was. I certainly don't know what Cupid's butt shaft is, but I can see in the notes that a butt shaft is apparently an unbarbed arrow and these were used in training and hit hard but were easily extracted. So there you go. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at the punctuation and what that tells us because those pieces of punctuation are the signposts for our journey. If you like, some of them might be speed limits, things to look out for. Um, they're all going to give us as, as actors or as literature students indications as to the state of mind of the character. You really would be surprised at the depth and the amount of clues that are held within the text. Like I say, it's my opinion, you might not believe it, but I firmly believe that nobody gives you more to draw on than Shakespeare does. And as an actor, a lot of these texts are absolute treasure troves. And a lot of it lies within the punctuation. And like I said before, it's really easy to just process it in your brain, but not actually physicalize it in your body. And these pieces of punctuation are there to help you as an actor to get these up onto their feet and to find a rhythm and to plan that journey and negotiate these maps, these blueprints that Shakespeare is setting down for us for a performance. Because every play is a blueprint for a performance. Um, it helps me, certainly, as an actor, to read it as such. Now, some more ethereal thinkers might think that that's a bit scientific um, or forensic, it helps me. It helps me. It always has and it always will. And I use it in combination with a lot more natural processes. But the nuts and bolts of these things can be useful for actors and you don't have to shy away from them. Yeah? You don't have to improvise and explore everything. Some of it can be nuts and bolts and mechanics. And especially with things like this, where you're just trying to get them up onto their feet initially, it can be a big help. It has been to me, hopefully it will be to some of you. So what we're going to do now is the second part of the exercise, the one where we start walking until we hit a piece of punctuation and then we change direction. 
every piece of punctuation apart from an apostrophe, okay? So we're going to read it through together and I'm going to change direction of every piece of punctuation. Off we go. I do affect the very ground, which is base, where her shoe, which is baser, guided by her foot, which is basest, doth tread. I shall be forsworn, which is a great argument of falsehood, if I love. And how can that be true love which is falsely attempted? Love is familiar, love is a devil. There is no evil angel but love. Yet was Samson so tempted, and he had an excellent strength. Yet was Solomon so seduced, and he had a very good wit. Cupid's butt shaft is too hard for Hercules' club, and therefore too much odds for a Spaniard's rapier. Okay, interesting. So I would like to do that again. If you have time yourself, if you would like to pause the video and do that again for yourself, that would be greatly appreciated. I'm not going to do it again now because I'm aware of um, the time that we have for the session. But what do I notice? I do affect, I do love, I do affect the very ground which is base, where her shoe, which is baser, guided by her foot, which is basest, doth tread. Okay, the same thing that we had in the previous text. This is somebody who has a point. I love the ground that she walks on. So he could come in and say, I love the ground that she walks on. Doesn't. Deviates. Several times. Whereas before it might be an indication of nervousness or status, this, it gives an almost bumbling sort of impression of the character. I don't really know the character. I don't really know the character very well. I don't know the play very well, okay? Just by that punctuation, it gives me this sense of a bumbling character. In fact, if you do it backwards and forwards, go, I do affect the very ground, which is base, where her shoe, which is baser, guided by her foot, which is basis, doth tread. I love the ground she walks on. That, that would have sufficed. That would have been the point that the character was, was trying to make. But the base, baser, and basis also tells us something about the character, that the ground is base, base being lowly, and her shoe is even lowlier, and her foot is even lowlier. So he sees everything, all of these elements, as beneath him. And there's obviously an emphasis there, because the extremity of, and the, um, yeah, the escalation of base, baser, Basest is interesting to me as an actor. It's a level of attack that seems to want to um, accelerate as well. And how can that be true love which is falsely attempted? And you get a full question there. So you've had this dithering line. I do affect the very ground which is base, where her shoe which is baser, guided by her foot which is basest, doth tread. And then you've got this nice and how can that be true love which is falsely attempted? Genuine line of questioning. There's no babbling there. It's just one straight line of questioning. And how can that be true love which is falsely attempted? Lovely. Then you get all of these staccato. Love is familiar. Love is a devil. There is no evil angel but love. The is there interestingly, is what I'm drawn to. He's sure. Love is a familiar. Contrast that to the other one. If, by your art, you're not setting off on the wrong foot with this, love is a familiar. Love is a devil. There is no evil angel but love. Sure, sure, I'm sure. Those are facts, facts, facts. Interesting. Interesting that love is capitalised. Love is capitalised on there is no evil angel but love. Yet was Samson tempted and he had excellent strength. Samson, notably a strong character, um, 
could just leave it at Samson was tempted, but deviates and adds a little bit extra information. Yet was Samson tempted, and he had excellent strength. Okay, it almost gives you that seesaw effect. And then you get the repetition of yet. So yet was Samson so tempted, and he had an excellent strength. Yet was Solomon so seduced, and he had a very good wit. Okay, so that repetition of yet. But even, even Samson, even Solomon, that repetition. So because you've got a repetition, you don't necessarily want to be delivering it the same way twice unless you're doing it for a particular effect. So it's almost you need to go one further, yet this, yet that, okay? Um, and Cupid's butt shaft is too hard for Hercules' club and therefore too much at odds for a Spaniard's rapier. So Cupid's arrow, so Cupid's arrow, a symbol of love, is too hard for Hercules' club. So Hercules, notoriously a powerful character, he's no competition for love. So the, the, um, what I'm deducing from this is no matter who you are, how strong you think you are, how witty you think you are, you are always, always susceptible to love. And I'm getting that from the words and from the punctuation, but I'm getting something which is going to be useful in getting this speech off the ground. And there's nothing worse than just sitting there with a chunk of text and thinking, where do I start? Where do I begin? And where do I go from there? And if we use this idea of Shakespearean text as a map and as actors or as students of literature, planning a route through that map, planning that journey, looking at potential pitfalls and points of interest and physicalizing the punctuation to make it more explicit. Hopefully that will stand you in good stead for getting something like that up onto its feet. Now another thing you can do is you can use something called percussive punctuation. So instead of changing direction, you assign a sound to each piece of punctuation. So for every comma, you might click. So it would be, I do affect the very ground. And then for every hyphen, you might slap your leg. So I do affect the very ground, which is base, wear her shoe, which is baser, guided by her foot, which is basis, doth tread, stamp for full stop. And it might just bring something out in the text for you. You might think, Gosh, I seem to be slapping my leg a lot. Gosh, I seem to be stamping a lot. Okay? And again, if somebody's using a lot of full stops, it usually means that they have come to the end of their point. Whereas if they're you know, using a lot of commas, just quick little changes in thought, quick little deviations from their point. And as I say, the more somebody deviates from their point, the more you start to think, why? Why are they deviating away from their point? They could easily have come in here and just said this. They didn't. Why is that the case? Okay. What is going on with them in this moment that makes them deviate away from that? All interesting stuff. Um, I could talk about it forever. I won't. I will leave you to explore that in your own time. Try it yourself with different pieces of text. Use pieces of text that you're not familiar with and just see what you can glean and practice, practice, practice getting these 2D speeches up onto their feet. Because like I say, they are blueprints for people. They're blueprints for performances. And it's all there. It's all there within the text. And Shakespeare does it better than anyone else. It's an absolute treasure trove. And um, I hope you get as much enjoyment out of exploring it as I do. Thank you for tuning in. And... Uh, yeah, hopefully I will see you again at the Customs House sometime very soon.